Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and during these half-hour programs, I'll be interviewing writers about their craft, their ambitions in writing, their careers in writing. Those careers might be in poetry, they might be in advertising, they might be in fiction, they might be in nonfiction. We plan to cast a very, very wide net. We'll be exchanging information, of course, here on the writer's net, the writer's, the writer's block, excuse me, but we hope to have a good time doing it as well. The show will be varied, relaxed, and open to your comments as well. If you have ideas for us here at the Writer's Block, or if you'd like to be on the Writer's Block, watch for our address at the end of the program. Tonight's guest is Kim Bartlett, a nonfiction writer who has lived in Cape Ann for 20 years. For all of those 20 years, he's been writing. For four of them, he got paid regularly. That's when he worked and wrote for the Gloucester Daily Times. For the other 16 years, he was self-employed. Some of the products of those 16 years of self-employed writing were the book, The Finest Kind, about which we'll talk about in a few minutes, Gulf Star 45, and Buying Time. Besides being a writer and self-employed as a writer, Kim has been employed in other occupations, occupations which he later wrote about in his books. He's been, among other things, a seaman, a teacher, a contractor, a fishmonger, and a uh, raiser of turkeys, although he's not raising turkeys anymore, I'm told. Right now, let's go over and meet Kim. Howdy. Thanks for being on the show. Pleasure. It's nice to have you. Pleasure. I wanted to mention, and make sure I emphasized in the introduction, that you combined your real life work experience with your writing work experience. Can you tell us more about how you did both and how they came in sequence and how the ideas came? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question of, of, of chicken and egg. Uh, basically, uh, I'm the kind of person that likes to be doing things, physically doing things. And, uh, and, and traveling and meeting people, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to have a, a reason for doing these things. I mean, if you're, if you're a good Yankee, you have to have a, a reason for doing things. So writing is really my reason for doing all the various things that I try to get around to doing, uh, which is kind of how I get, got to writing uh, Finest Kind and Gulf Star and even buying time. Is the writing the reason, or is the writing the excuse to do no, things that really are oh, no, interesting? No, no, the writing is the excuse. <laughs> to do something you want to do. To do, do something anyway. I want to do. It's, it's, it's a license to do things that most people aren't generally allowed to do. Uh, when I was doing a lot of freelancing in the past, it was, half the motivation was just wanting to know secrets of different occupations and different oh, people. Oh, absolutely. So that's the excuse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can get through more doors by just simply saying you're a writer. The first uh, work experience here is the seaman. Oh, when, when were you a, a seaman? And that was, that was here in Cape Ann? Well, no, actually, I was a seaman long before <coughs> that. Um, I, I think that every male writer, if one has a license to be chauvinist about this, um, kind of tries to mirror his life, at least the starting of his writing career, on Hemingway. And so at a certain point in my time, I, I, I left the country and, and, uh, and went to Europe and lived in Europe uh, for a number of years. And in, in the course of doing that, um, I ended up uh, satisfying a, a, a youthful fantasy working as an ordinary seaman on a, uh, on a freighter in Holland. I was actually a, a card-carrying member of the Dutch Merchant Marine. As a, a coastal, uh, well, on it a was. coastal ship? Uh, it was a coastal ship. Uh, uh, you had two choices. You either did the coastal ship or you did what they call the Neutkom Taruk, which are the never-come-back ships that took off around the world for two or three years. And what we did was I went from Amsterdam to Rotterdam, through the Baltic up to Stockholm, and, and back. And, uh, it was about a three-week month trip, and I did it for six or eight months. Did you go to Spain and uh, chase bulls at the I I, No, actually, I, but I did. I spent a summer in Spain uh, with a, a Dutch geographical, a geological expedition in the northwest uh, part of Spain. Uh, and I went down there to, uh, to skipper a uh, research vessel for them. Uh, they were mapping out some of the bays in northwest uh, Spain, the La Coruña uh, area of Spain. So you were a seaman in Europe first before you were a seaman. Before I came here. Uh, to, to, for, 
to Cape Ann. To Cape Ann. I came, I came to Cape Ann because there was a job at the Gloucester Times. And, um, and, and loving the sea as I did, um, I was able to be the, the waterfront reporter. And then when I left the Times, um, well, actually, I left the Times to write a book about diamond smuggling in Liberia, which uh, didn't work out too terribly well. And so I came back here and uh, it started Finest Kind. The Finest Kind draws on your background as a seaman and your reporting. Well, it helped. Uh, I wasn't here, seasick. Here uh, I, I think that was one of the main advantages of uh, my, my seaman's experience. I, I was used to rolling waves. Excuse me, I'm falling apart. I can here. see that, John. This is <laughs> I'm sorry to be here at the demise. Uh, <laughs> Would you like time to regroup here? It <laughs> never happens on local television. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> I want to reach over here and, buy and, and pick up the finest kind to see if we can show that. Can you explain how your background in seamanship and your covering the waterfront for the Gloucester Times combined into this? If it did, or maybe well, it I, I, I think it, it could stretch it. Uh, uh, only in that that I like being on the sea. I've always liked being on the sea. Uh, I mean, believe it or not, I did have a, 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 a lifelong dream or an early dream of, of being in the Merchant Marine and I probably would have continued to be in the Merchant Marine but I have bad eyes and and therefore I would never be a skipper or never be a captain or a pilot or anything like that. Um, what got me most excited about the chance of, of doing the finest kind uh, quite frankly was that good as, as Kipling's book was um, it wasn't it didn't speak to the fishermen of today. I mean, we're talking about it, but this book was written in 1976, but fishing had changed, and the fishermen, today's fishermen, weren't getting the kind of credit that the old uh, uh, longliners were getting. And I felt that there was a story in today's fishermen, in, in the Gloucester fishermen, uh, that was equally worthy of being told, and that's basically the genesis of that book. You mentioned this is not still in print. It's it's um, not. It's it's it should be. It, it it's people call me up all the time and say, where can I get a copy? Where can I get a copy? Where it's, can they where can they read a copy? Well, they can read a copy at your local library, um, any local library, uh, on the, probably on the North Shore, maybe even on the East East Coast. It sold very well on the East Coast. Um, <clears throat> it was by Norton. It was by Norton. Let's go to another book. Let's do it. The, uh, if I got the right order, Gulf yep. Star 45. Gulf Star 45. About oil. This is about is oil. Yeah. A big Th topic. This this so is the one that was going to make me a fortune. <laughs> there were some flaws with this one. Unfortunately, it did not make me a fortune. Gulf Star. Can we show this as well? I'd like to show the cover of this. What does the title Gulf Star 44 refer to? Well, it's Gulf Star 45, and 40, excuse me. that's right. Uh, and, and, and actually, I think one of the reasons uh, one of the reasons the book didn't sell as well as it, I think it could have. Um, was the title. And I'll tell you, if you can't see, uh, those of you who are looking in and looking at that cover, can't see what that is on the cover, but it is an oil rig. It's an, off it's an offshore uh, semi-submersible oil rig, and it is a rig called Penrod 75, 72. And there's a long story, and we haven't got the time to go into the story, but when I decided to, to, to write about the people that work on oil rigs, um, I went down to the Gulf of Mexico on an exploratory trip one August and somehow miraculously ended up on a semi-submersible oil rig called Penrod 72. And I was told if I really was serious about this book, I could come back and work on this rig. And I came back five months later and the fellow who had offered me the job no longer worked for them, etc. So I had to actually get a job as a, as a roustabout on a, any oil rig. and somehow miraculously I ended up working for the Penrod Drilling Company and they sent me out to Penrod 72 and I thought that there was some sort of an omen in that and then I was able to find this picture of the rig um, the, as opposed this book as opposed to to the finest kind the names are fictitious although it's a true story we changed the names in this and for fear that H.L. Hunt who owned Penrod 72 might get upset <laughs> His na the name of the book of his rig appeared as the title of my book. So my editor at Norton, uh, who was a, 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 a uh, transatlantic sailor, uh, called up and said, can we change the name from Penrod 72 to Gulf Store 45, which uh, I understand is the name of a, of a sailboat. 
Uh, it basically, it doesn't tell you very it much about... It could be science fiction, it, it could be could, a murder story. It could it be, be absolutely a, anything. It doesn't tell you very much about what the, what the story is. And it's, frankly, it's, it's, this is my favorite book. Um, and I, can t and I, I, I in all deference to the Gloucester Fisherman, etc., uh, the reason this is my favorite book is that I was a Yankee, uh, and everybody on the, uh, on the rig, for the most part, were either Cajuns from southern Louisiana or for, were uh, from the, uh, the flats and the, and, the, and the Gulf area of, of Mississippi. So it, it was a cultural experience for me, and therefore that's why that book is written in the first person. Um, how did, you said you always had, as a youth, a dream of being a maritime seaman. True. Where did you get the idea to be a roustabout on an oil rig? Uh, a very, very dear friend of mine, after whom I, my uh, eldest son is named, a Dutchman, um, who, with whom I went on that, on that famous trip to Spain, um, is, a, is a geologist, and he worked all over the world on, um, on oil rigs, as a geologist on oil rigs. And he would write me letters about these incredible people that he would meet, most of whom were Americans, most of whom were from Mississippi, um, on oil rigs all around the world. And so when I sold uh, uh, Finest Kind, uh, my agent said, we just sold Finest Kind, what's the next book? And, and I'd never sold a book before, and it was kind of a tough question to answer the second one while I was trying to just adjust to the fact that I'd finally sold a book. And uh, so I said, we're going to do it on oil rigs. And that's... You said on the phone. Yeah, he says, we'll do it on oil rigs. And uh, he was able to sell that idea, and uh, off we went. So you had the idea bought, or had he sold the idea before you went down. Right, for, for all those writers out there who, <laughs> who, who are looking for good luck stories, that happens to be a good luck story. It is. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't usually happen that way. So it didn't take years to plan this. It took about two seconds? It took about two seconds, couple. yeah. You have some kind of perspective that most Americans don't on oil, I imagine. Does, that's, that's not even a question yet, but well, can, can you respond to that and <laughs> give some reactions to maybe, oil? Maybe, maybe. Would you want to follow the question? Um, I, I, no, I have... This, this, is a, this isn't a story about oil. Uh, it's a story about the people that, that okay. um, drill for the oil. And, 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 and it's, when I was writing uh, Finest Kind, it was at, at the very time that the 200-mile limit was an issue. And people constantly asked me what was my attitude towards the 200-mile limit. And my answer was, I'm writing about the fishermen. I have no attitude at this point about the 200-mile limit. I'm more interested in the fishermen, who they are. Uh, I, have, I have attitudes about oil, uh, particularly today I have attitudes about oil. But as regards that book, I have more attitudes about Southerners okay. uh, than I do about um, oil. All right. So the, the people are the center. The pay, people are always the center that, of my books. Okay. I want to go to buying time, but I just thought of a question that go ahead. I've tried to ask at a couple other programs because I think it's technically important to people who want to write. When you write, what is the process like? I mean in detail from sitting down to how much time you sit down to how much time you spend on research to whether you strap yourself in the chair or not. What's, what's the process like? Well, I, th I think, John, that you can ask every person that's going to sit in this chair, and you'll probably, each one of us will give you a, a different answer if we've been successful enough to actually have produced something. Um, I can tell you what my process is. Uh, yeah, my, process, my process works uh, on, on what I call the theory of obsession. Um, these three books, which are the only three books I've, I've written to date, are basically are brought about by my going and doing something and being a part of, a, of, a, of somebody else's life or the life of a group of people for a given period of time. And then I pull out of it and then I go up to my desk and I begin to describe what I saw and who the people were, who the people were that I, I dealt with and some of my own observations. And I very rarely write with notes. Um, basically, and there's some people that will say, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that it reads that way, too. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I believe if, if you get so obsessed with your subject, you do your outlining and your note-taking, etc., for the most part, in your head. You're constantly working on a daily basis, as opposed to a, a newspaper reporter, for instance, who goes out and has one interview and comes back. 
They simply haven't been there long enough to really understand what the story yeah. is. Uh, you can tell, too. Uh, sometimes it's, it's obvious, and sometimes, no, sometimes they get away with it. But in this case, when I sit down to write, I have a pretty good idea of where I'm going to start and where I'm going to end. And the question is bringing out the tale in... in I mean, each, each book is a, is, a, is a total tale, and you're telling a lot of tales in between, and you have to line them up, and sometimes you have to compress time. But basically, it's, I write slowly and steadily. I, I do not do a whole lot of revision as I go along. It's one sentence, and then another sentence, and then another sentence. While you were working on the oil rig, were you writing at night? I was taking notes. Taking notes. Yeah. And, and, and then so you'd bring them back or digest them I before digest them. you. Right. And then you'd come back and write straight through for well, no, I, weeks I, or months. Well, in, in this case, uh, uh, with, with Gulf Star, I lived, um, my wife was good enough to let me go away for three months. And I went down and lived in New Orleans and then worked on the oil rigs on a seven and seven basis, seven days on the rig, seven days off the rig. So you work seven days, 12 hours a day, et cetera, et cetera. It was pretty rigorous and dangerous. Uh, and then seven days you had to yourself. And in New Orleans, that's not a bad place to have seven days by yourself. What did your wife say about that? She, uh, she knew very little, little about it. <laughs> I, all I can say is when I called her up and said, I'm ready to come home, but can I, uh, can I wait a week? Uh, she said, no, you've got to come home right away. And what she was keeping me away from was there was a jazz heritage uh, uh, festival, and I've never forgiven her for it. Um, you better not get into that. Yeah, it was, a, it was also the blizzard of 78, and she was still trying to dig out from the blizzard of 78. So, I remember uh, that well. She, she had a certain... Uh, uh, I mean, she was right. She, she could haul me back. She had a perfect right to do that. New Orleans is not a bad place to be. Not a that. bad place to be alone. The third book. I want to see if we can do a, another close-up. Buying Time, an Established Business Fights for Survival. Can we... I'll hold that for a long time if we can get a uh, close-up on Buying Time. This title is a little clearer. You know, it's about business. Yeah, it is. It is. This is kind of an interesting book um, to, to show you what, what dumb luck uh, has, has, has brought me to date. Um, there was a bit of a gap between Gulf Star and Buying Time, um, at which point I, I, I had changed agents. This is what, what year is this? Uh, I think it was 83 that that ultimately came out. And I changed agents um, for certain illogical reasons, which is generally why writers change agents. Now, there is no logical reason to change an agent. Um, and he had lunch one day with an editor at, at, at uh, Little Brown who said she had an idea and she was looking around for somebody to handle the idea. And he called me on the phone and said, how would you like to write a book about manufacturing? Uh, which was about the least exciting idea I could think of, but I was also without a book. And uh, so that was how that came about. I said, he said, give me oh, about six pages of your ideas on a book on manufacturing, and let's see what we can do with it. So that, that was, I suppose if you hadn't been home to answer the phone, he might have gone to somebody else in his stable. Uh, no, I don't think it would. I, no, I, I, I take a little bit more credit than that. Uh, the kind of book that she had in mind was, was right up the, kind of the alley of the kind of books I write. Uh, she w her feeling was, and I think it's an interesting proposition, although perhaps less interesting now than it, wa than it has been in America's past. What company was that about? I can't tell you. I mean, I could tell you, but I won't. It's just an agreement. Uh, oh, okay. Um, right. it was, this book came out, uh, I started to research it much at the same time uh, that the um, Soul of the New Machine came out. As you remember, the sold machine, new machine was about, it was a digital, or dec, uh, um, data general, digital. anyway, it, uh, uh, Tracy yeah. Kidder's book Tracy, about yeah. a success story, um, <coughs> in which he'd, he spent a lot of time with a company and described all the people involved in making it a success. Um, my task here, and the reason that, that, that Gene Young, uh, who was the editor at, 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 um, at Little Brown at the time, was interested in my doing the book, was she wanted to know who were the people involved in the manufacturing of, for lack of a better term, widgets. That is to say, just things. 
And when you drive down the road and people drive with you and then they turn off and they park in a parking lot and they go inside a building and there they spend the next eight hours, who are these people making these things that may appear in our kitchen behind something you never see them and yet this is what they do for a living? This is people emphasis again. This again is the people this emphasis. Um, and that basically is, is the essence of this book. Um, it is a, a company, it is, happens to be a Massachusetts company, um, <coughs> and it makes something. And what I was allowed to do was just be in the company, and I could therefore be on the loading dock, and I could be in the corporate boardroom, I could be anywhere I wanted, just with the company. What made this, uh, you don't mind if I monologue here a little bit, do you? No, please, uh, <laughs> please, that's what the show's for. Okay. Um, what made this kind of fascinating was that it was, I started it in 1981, I think, started researching it, and I couldn't start as quickly as I wanted because the company was going down the tubes. It was, a, it was the beginning of our last recession. I remember it well. It does you remember it well? And uh, this was a time when John Deere and all these wonderful big companies were going down, where so were small companies like this, which is a 75-year-old company, was headed down the tubes. And so I, they, maybe one of the reasons they were headed down the tubes is they did things like letting people like me come in and watch them do it. Um, but I was not only able to watch how things were made and who the people were that made the things and how decisions were made, but how decisions were made to try to keep making them, if you can follow yep. that. Uh, and in point of fact, the company did succeed um, in staying afloat although I'm not too so terribly sure it's afloat today. With your help? Or oh, I'm sure with an enormous or... amount of help from me and all my wit and wisdom in these matters. Um, the other thing that made this book interesting to me was that my father was in manufacturing, and I never knew what he did, and my brother never knew. I, neither of us ever really knew or I think really cared what he did. He went off every day, and he came back, and, and, and we lived perfectly well. Um, all, we, all I know is my brother's a psychiatrist and I'm a writer and neither of us are in manufacturing. So this gave me a chance to kind of go back and visit again the kind of life that I think my father may have lived and try so to come to some sort of an understanding. There's two there. levels of personal interest. There. Yeah, in this case. Psychologically I was, personal for you and yeah. also about the people yeah. again. Yep, yeah. and I think I understood him better as a result of this. I wish he'd done something else that I could have known more about. But uh, well, if he'd been a psychiatrist, you it, would have been a manufacturer. I probably would have been a manufacturer. Yeah, yeah there's no, I don't think so. But uh, I've got a style question. I don't know if this ahead. is going to be possible. When we have poets on, and when poets read, it's understood they read some of their work because, well, I don't know exactly why it's understood. It's there's what supposed, poets there's do. There's supposed to be right. kind of a richness there. Yeah. Uh, which by uh, kind of a, it's a tacit statement almost that people who write nonfiction or fiction aren't as stylistically legitimate. Now, when I want to ask you, I didn't, didn't oh, this preview is, this, this, this before is a setup the, question. Go the ahead. show. <laughs> are, are there passages in here that you could point to or read us a paragraph that, that you think are particularly good, clear examples of what you do? Well, I, 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 I think because I'm going to say no, I won't do it. Uh, I think there are all sorts of examples of clear <laughs> There's <laughs> the same pithy and amazing writing in there. Um, in point of fact, I, I think there probably are. And, and, and borrowing from Somerset Maugham, um, who said, when, the minute I finish a book, I never go back over it and never read it again. I, I have not read these books uh, since I wrote them. Uh, so I don't know where the parts are. <laughs> and, and I'm afraid, frankly, if I read anything from, from Gulf or from Finest Kind, uh, I, I would again not be able to drink on Roger Street for another 10 years, so I think I'm going to beg off. All right. I won't force that. Thank you. We'll do a show next week and I'll read some you of You read some of my stuff, you, stuff and then you won't gone. be able to drink on Roger Street. I ask another style question. Where, where do you drink on Roger Street these days? <laughs> you don't want to go near that no, one? No, no, I don't want to okay. go near that one. Roger Street See. for some of our audiences. Uh, Central, Central Street in Gloucester, known in part for its honky tonks, I guess I, I can't think of a better. Well, word. I think that. Well, I, I, my, my reference is John that when when uh, uh, Finest Kind came out, it caused some sort of a stir amongst the Italian community and the, and the fishing families, particularly the wives, 
because I, I actually quoted fishermen verbatim in certain cases. <coughs> and, and what's said on the waterfront stays on the waterfront. And unfortunately, by writing it, I took it off the waterfront and put it in people's houses. And so the, the, the word went out, I'd better not show up at the house of Medjor. <laughs> and that's <laughs> when you grew the beard. That's when the yeah. beard came yeah. on, right? <laughs> and the glasses. <laughs> yeah. I was just surprised, as I usually am, by the two-minute sign. Good Lord. It's fast, very fast. I had about four or five more questions that I'm not going to be able to get to because we have to thank you and present you with the Writer's Block Award for being on the show. It's well, a John, jar of white out. I, can, I can't tell you how I, I appreciate I, this. I, I, and my sure, children to move, they'll sure, really love it. I'm sure you do. Uh, use, it in, use it in health and... Uh, and, uh, and maybe with and, wealth and profit, sure. some profit in, in your next endeavors. Amen. Thank you very much Thank for being you, here. Thank you as well for being with us here this evening on the Writer's Block. I hope talking to Kim has helped you learn something about writing and learn something about how to write. If you have, then the show has been a success. I hope to see you all again next time on the Writer's Block. Good night.